Hello, everybody, and welcome to our 2023 Cross the Pond pilot briefing for Cross the Pond Westbound. My name is Evan. I'm the co-founder of Flight Simulation Association. It's a pleasure to be here live with you and with our panelists who you'll see coming up on the screen in just a moment. Today's session is all about getting you ready for Cross the Pond. If you're a new Vatson pilot, if you're someone who's flown Cross the Pond maybe once or twice, if it's your first Cross the Pond, if it's your 30th Cross the Pond, we are here to talk all about Vatson's largest event of the year and give you tips, tricks, and suggestions from people who have done it before. So what you're going to see coming up in about 10 to 15 minutes is a thorough briefing on everything you need to know, starting with departing from Europe, flying across the ocean, and finally landing over in North America. The presentation will take about 45 minutes, but that 45 minutes starts about 10 or 15 minutes from now. I've got a couple of admin things to cover. We're going to give people some time to filter in and join the stream. So now's a good time to grab a drink or coffee or tea or whatever it is you might be drinking at my time. It's 11 a.m., but of course, over in Europe, it's getting to be that time of day. So feel free to do that and settle yourselves in. In about 10 or 15 minutes, we'll get started on the actual 45-minute presentation where we walk through everything you need to know for Cross the Pond. But before we do that, a couple of important things I need to talk about. First of all, nothing that we are going to say today is applicable to real world aviation. This is all about flight simulation. This is for use on the VATSIM network in your home flight simulator. And obviously, this is not real world aviation training material, nor is it suited for anything like that. I'm going to go ahead and bring on our presenters today, and we'll do a couple of quick introductions. You'll see Rob from Slant Alpha Adventures, Josh from both FATSIM ATC and TFDI Design. But perhaps most importantly, let me start by introducing the president of the FATSIM Network, who's going to walk through the first couple of slides with us. Tim Barber, good to have you on today. Canada, um, I'm very, very happy to join you today. And, uh, and, and thank you and to everyone who is joining today uh, for this pilot briefing for our 2023 Westbound Cross the Pond. It is one of VATSIM's biggest events that we host, and we host it twice a year. Uh, we do Westbound uh, in the, at the first half of the year. We do Eastbound in the second half of the year. And of course, this time we are doing Westbound. Uh, during our biggest event, which was in 2020, we had north of 3,000 uh, connections going at that time. Uh, it is the biggest strain on our network, for sure. Uh, all of our tech people are on uh, full duty that day to make sure we uh, try and keep everything as smooth as possible for everybody connected to the network. Uh, a couple of reminders for everyone. You do require a slot to participate in this event. And unfortunately, as with uh, most popular events, uh, we often don't have enough slots for the number of pilots who want to fly in the event. So please, unless you have a slot, don't try and connect during the event. Don't try and participate uh, during the event in the space, the airspace where it's being, uh, being held. Uh, just make sure, uh, however, to participate in the network in other places. Um, there's going to be lots of ATC on that day. Um, if you uh, want to connect in North America and do some flights in the Northeast U.S., uh, Canada, uh, in Europe and other places, you'll have lots of ATC to participate in non-event uh, traffic. So feel free to enjoy the network that day, but unless you have a slot, uh, don't join in the oceanic uh, flight for across the pond westbound. Um, it's very important to remember that this is not an event for beginner pilots. Um, not only do you sort of need to know what you're doing, and that's what this briefing is for, is to help the pilots figure that out, but you need to know how to fly your airplane and you need to fly an airplane that is not only suitable for the event, but also has the equipment and the up-to-date nav data for this event as well. Make sure you're up-to-date, make sure you know what you're flying and make sure that that airplane is suitable for the event. Um, Cessna 172s, definitely not. Uh, the brand new Antonov, if you're not familiar with how to fly that airplane, we recommend that you don't use it for this event. What happens is we get disruptions to the event and uh, it requires intervention from our supervisors and administrators. And that's something that we do want to event. We want this to be an amazing event for the pilots, an amazing event for the controllers. And so if we follow just sort of these basic rules that we set out, then it will be exactly that. Um, during the session, you're gonna learn a lot about European departure procedures. You're going to learn about the oceanic procedures, including NAPTRAC, which is our position reporting system. 
you're going to learn the best tips and practices for rivals in Canada and the United States. And the team will also be giving you additional resources to help make this uh, as enjoyable for you as possible. At the end, what we want to do and what the team today wants to do is make sure that you're prepared for Cross the Pond next weekend. Again, just a reminder, it is for reasonably experienced VATSIM jet liner pilots. Uh, if you don't have a really, really good ability to control the aircraft and handle stuff that may not be a normal uh, event in your, in your flight, then this might not be the event for you. At the end of the day, I want to wish everyone a great event. I want to uh, let everyone know that I will be personally at uh, Flight Sim Expo in Houston in June, and I look forward to seeing everybody there. If you see me, please uh, come up and say hi, introduce yourself. I look forward to meeting everybody at the VATSIM display there. And Evan, with that, let me turn it back over to you. Perfect. Well, thank you again, Tim, for jumping on with us and for being part of today's live stream and kicking us off uh, with that great introduction. And of course, we'll look forward to seeing you and many others from VATS over at Flights and Expo. I'll do a couple of quick introductions, and we're just about five minutes away from getting started. Our three presenters today, we start off in just a few moments looking at Europe, and that'll be with Josh Riley. He's an S2 VATSM supervisor and also COO of Invernix, the company behind TFDI Design and Jetstream Radio. So Josh will be live with you here in just a couple minutes covering off Europe. For Oceanic, that'll be presented by Alex Ying, an instructor over at the New York ARTCC. He's not on video, but he is here on voice listening in the background. So you'll hear him in just a couple minutes talking through Oceanic. And finally, the ever comedic Rob Shearman Jr. from Slants Alpha Adventures will be on with us to present the North American segment looking at the arrival process of Cross the Pond. Vatsim controllers since I'm just going to say forever basically at this point and former CFI over at Vatstar and as well uh, newly minted S3 at the DC Air TCC. I had to even change the presentation slides that we used from last year to, to just <laughs> that number two to number three is a big accomplishment, Rob. So congratulations and thanks for being here with oh, us today. I'm, I'm terrible at it, so don't congratulate me for it. <laughs> <laughs> and for those who don't know me, my name is Evan. I'm the co-founder of Flights and Association, but also a Vatsim pilot. I'm here representing my home facility of Boston. I'm sure I'll be controlling somewhere and across the pond. If Cam Peterson is watching, Boston Final would be great. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we'll look forward to a great event coming up on Saturday next weekend. As Tim mentioned, Flights and Expo is happening June 23rd to 25th. I think everyone on the stream today yeah, will all be at Flights and Expo. So, like Tim said, love to say hi and see folks who are there at the show. Vatson will be there. We've got a nice room that kind of looks like a control tower, honestly, that like looks out over the airport. And that's where you'll be able to see and experience the Vatson so cool. experience in person. Yeah, it should be a lot of, a lot of fun. Now, this event, of course, the, the presentation that we're doing today, obviously, it's all about people who are new to oceanic flying. And so for that reason, we want to highlight that Fatson is actually doing a sort of a pre-cross the pond event, which is called First Wings Cross the Pond Preparation. And that happens tomorrow. Basically, it's, it's almost exactly 24 hours from uh, now, pretty much anyway, but tomorrow at 12 UTC. And basically, it's just an opportunity to get on and practice, especially if you've never done Oceanic before. Now, just like the real Cross the Pond, to pr actually participate in the practice Cross the Pond, you also need a booking. So you can find the details about this event at first dash wings dot fatsim dot net and again if you've never flown oceanic before you've never flown across the pond before this is a great way to kind of get yourself ready to go all of the fatsim first wings events are specifically tailored toward people who've only maybe flown once or twice on the network so the controllers know you're brand new they're taking it easy it's intentionally a less busy experience than most of the other fatsim events so this is a great way to get yourself into flying shape for across the pond you can go book that slot for yourself right now at first-wings.batsim.net. One last piece of admin here is that NatTrack, which as Tim mentioned, is the position reporting software that we use for Cross the Pond. They are running a mini test of that on March 27th, so two days from now, at 1800 UTC. They only need a few people to participate in this, and there is no guaranteed ATC coverage, but it's just about making sure that they can actually practice and test out how that system works so it's in good shape for the live event when it comes up on Saturday, April 1st. So if you wanted to help out with that mini test of NatTrack, you can fly on NatTrack Charlie entering the ocean between 18 to 19 Zulu. Again, there's no guarantee of ATC coverage. The whole point of this is not about ATC coverage. It's about just testing out that software and making sure that it works according to plan. 
with that in mind, I think we are just about ready to get started here. Remember, you can send in your questions. I'm doing my best to keep an eye on two places. I'm watching the FSA chat number one, and I'm watching the Discord. So if you haven't already joined the Vatsim Cross the Pond Discord, I'll go ahead and put that link up on the screen here in a second here. And you can uh, basically just send in your questions via the Vatsim Cross the Pond Discord. And if you post a question in there, I will save it and bring it up in the Q&A portion at the end of today's stream. Friendly reminder, we're starting with European operations. We're going to talk next about the ocean. And then finally, we'll go into North American arrival procedures. And that kicks off with Josh Riley here in just a second. But let me remind everybody, probably the most important takeaway from today's webinar, we're going to give you lots of resources and suggestions. But everything that you need to know is in the pilot briefing document. So if you have a cross the pond slot, which is what you need to fly across the ocean, you will also have access to a pilot briefing for your departure airport, for the oceanic segments if you're crossing the North Atlantic, and for your arrival airport. Really important that you take the time to review those documents. I would start, of course, with the departure one, and then the other two you can even look at while you're in the flight on the way across. But great idea to have a really good look through all of those documents because they really do contain everything you need to know. And of course, we're giving you general information, <coughs> excuse me, but what you really want is the specific information about your facility. So we're going to talk about Europe in general, but of course, Europe is a big place. There's lots of different countries. There's lots of different procedures. And of course, there are some airports that we call Europe that aren't actually in Europe that are participating this year. And so we're giving general information, but the specifics can be found over in your pilot briefing documents. I think that covers everything I need to talk about. So Josh, I'm going to send things over to you. We can talk through uh, Europe and the departure phase of Cross the Pond. So Josh, thank you very much, of course, for being here. And I send things over to you. Thanks for having me, Evan. So hello, I'm Josh. Um, in this section, I'm going to start talking a little bit about European operations. So specifically going to look at altitudes, how to request clearance, the departure and climb, pushback taxi, all the way through to en route CP DLC as well. So to begin with transition altitudes and levels, in Europe it does vary airport to airport. So unlike in the US where it's standard across the board, it can be anywhere from 3,000 feet to 11,000 feet in others. So it's very important to check the charts. So as you can see on the right hand side, we've got the Gatwick charts. As you can see at the very top, it says trans alt 6,000. That means the transition altitude is 6,000 feet. Now the transition level, that is the ATC aligned lowest usable flight level, and it's not usually shown on the charts because it can vary on pressure. So if an ATC controller gives you a flight level, you know you're going to be on the standard pressure. And then if it's an altitude, you're going to be on the local QNH, which should be given to you. And now don't confuse the transition altitude with the level. So the transition altitude is going up and the transition level is coming back down. Again, in Europe, we do have various initial altitudes as well, and these are usually posted on the SID charts, but in most cases, ATC probably won't tell you what the initial climb is. So despite this, you do need to level at the initial climb altitude or level until further advised, and again, it's all on the SID charts as well. So in the, in the one with the big red box here, the, you can see the initial climb clearance is 4,000 feet. That means you need to stop at 4,000 feet, and alternatively, above it, you know, do not climb above 5,000 feet unless cleared by ATC. So it should be somewhere on the charts. Now, we are also quite funny with having step climbs and departures as well, especially around the London area. So take the Lambourne 6 Mike departure, for example. You can see here you initially have to be above 1,500, then above 3,200, but below 4,000, then at 5,000, at 6,000. And you can tell those by just looking at the lines above each one as well. So if you need to be at a level, you'll see a line above and below it in the charts. Now, the flight plant altitude. Amongst the things that you'll find on the pilot briefing package on the website, you'll find a flight level as well, and this is only for the oceanic crossing. It means that you may use a slightly different flight level before and after you cross the ocean, but you need to use that flight level when requesting the oceanic clearance. Now, in this case, we're all going westbound. However, you still need to stick to the west, even west, east, even odd flight level allocation rule whenever you're flying in Europe and North America. However, it doesn't apply in oceanic airspace. Now, you need to, in this case, file a westbound even altitude and expect the even altitudes before and after the ocean, but you might get an odd altitude as you're going over the ocean. Now, once inside oceanic airspace, you can request different flight levels if you'd like to, and ATC will try to facilitate it if they're able to, but it's not a guarantee. Now, talking about being on the ground at the departure airport, there's a specific way you need to request clearance. So there's certain bits of information that you need to provide, and sometimes a controller might ask for it. 
But as standard, you need to give them your stand number, your aircraft type, the ATIS letter, and also the Q&H from the ATIS. Or you can use Hoppy, which we'll come to in just a minute. When you're in Europe, though, and you're flying a heavy aircraft, you need to append heavy to your call sign only on initial contact with delivery, just to show that you're a bigger aircraft. But again, that's not a requirement of the clearance. It's just something to help assist. So take, for example, Gatwick Delivery, hello, Speedbird 115 Heavy, Stand 53, Aircraft Type Boeing 787, Information Golf, QH 1023, Request Clearance to Boston. And that's everything you need to give them, and the delivery controller will know exactly what to do. Now, we did mention this just a minute ago, but we want to talk a little bit about Hoppy CPDLC DCL. Now, this is offered at many facilities in Europe, and it's not typically used within the US. But it's a system that allows you to send messages between the aircraft and ATC, the aircraft and dispatch, aircraft and the company, etc. So for ATC purposes, it's designed to just improve the automation and reduce the frequency congestion, especially during the en route portion of the flight. Now in Europe, you can have busy airspaces. So CPDLC just reduces the time that you need to speak on frequency and allows the controller to interact with more aircraft quicker. Now a lot of facilities in Europe do offer this, and then your pre-departure clearance could then be obtained using Hoppy's DCL with all the relevant information being in that message. So some aircraft, for example, the FS Labs, the Uni Builds, they all have CPDLC built in and you can fill out the forms within that and it will just send it automatically. And then there's also Easy CPDLC, which is just a standalone client that's compatible with VATSIM, which doesn't actually stop you from aircraft that don't necessarily have it involved to begin with, but you can still communicate via CPDLC if you wish. Because CrossPond is a really busy event, we're obviously recommending people to brief yourself on the departure. So we're talking altitudes, routing, speed restrictions, things of note, the frequencies that you've got to change to, the terrain, weather, and also even something as simple as an expected taxi route. So you need to brief the plan starting from the pushback. Think about what taxi routing you're going to get to the runway with, your takeoff, the V speeds, the SID, what to expect on it. Now, you don't know it's going to be 100% what you've planned for or what you'll be assigned but you can definitely make a, a well-educated guess based on where other aircraft are going. So try and brief on that as well. So in Europe, we have various nomenclature for ATC instructions for climbs, and we're going to go through a few of these. So in this instruction, climb via SID, flight level 130. And all that means is just you need to meet all the published altitude and speed restrictions on the SID up to flight level 130 until further advised. So whatever's on the charts, you need to make sure you're following that with the speed restrictions. So you can see this one here. You'd expect to be above flight level 90 uh, at Maran or above flight level 100 by TNR. And it all depends on what the ATC instructions give you. So in this case, a pilot instruction, meet all the published altitude and speed restrictions and don't exceed until further advised. Alternatively, you may hear climb to flight level 130, and by default, if nothing is stated, a standard climb instruction still requires the pilot to meet all the published altitude and speed restrictions on the SID, and again, not to exceed, in this case, flight level 130 until further advised by ATC, but not in the UK. Climb instructions from UK controllers, they always override the SID, so you may hear climb now or just climb, uh, and the idea is that we can just get people moving up quicker and try to get them above elsewhere. But if you're in doubt, just ask the controller, do I still need to adhere to the restrictions? And then you'll get told an answer. I mean, in most cases, if you're flying out of the UK, it's just going to be a case of getting up to the altitude that they told you to go to. Alternatively, you could also hear climb unrestricted to flight level 130. Now, all that means is that you don't have to worry about the altitudes and speeds. They don't apply. You just climb up to flight level 130. So basically the UK instruction with an extra word in it. Pushback and taxi, again, this is quite a common thing within Europe. And you need to report ready for pushback and engine start on the delivery frequency. So you don't self-hand over to the ground controller. You stay with delivery, and that's so that the delivery controller can then allocate the, the start times and make sure people are pushing at the right point without overloading the ground controller, who's got to be very busy with aircraft everywhere. Now, if delivery tells you to stand by, you might sometimes be given a pushback slot timer. That's when you should expect to push back, and delivery will call you when they're ready to push. So they might call you up and then tell you to hand over to ground. When you hand over to ground, you're going to want to tell them your location uh, as well in just a minute. Now, once you're taxiing out, you need to make sure that you exercise airmanship and obviously don't switch to tower's frequency again without being told to so make sure the controller tells you what to do if you're waiting there you've not been handed over a prompt after a few minutes might be in need but in most cases you just don't need to now if you're handed over to another unit they'll be 
there'll be a few different words that we use to tell people how to hand over. There's something you might not be familiar with. So contact, for example, that's a standard one. You call them with your call sign and your location. So it might be speedbird123, stand 56, request push and start. Or it might be speedbird123 on Juliet. Alternatively, you might hear contact with call sign only, and that means you just need to call up on the frequency with just your call sign. You don't even need to say tower, hello, just your call sign, so it's speedbird123. And finally, you might hear monitor as well. And that means you just switch to the frequency and just sit there in silence. You don't need to say anything. The ATC control will call you up if they need you. And that's just to reduce congestion again to save people calling up if it doesn't really make any difference. I also want to touch a little bit on en route CP DLC. And this is, again, going to be offered at many European en route facilities. And a lot of them, again, do offer CP DLC built in. The four-letter logon code in most cases will be part of the controller remarks. So as you can see in the example, in the nice orange box, Brussels control, CPDLC, EBBE. Now you need to type that one in, and then that's how you connect them via CPDLC. And as we touched on earlier, CPDLC is then designed to reduce the radio congestion, allowing aircraft and ATC to exchange simple on-route instructions, such as route direct, climb, descend, turn, things like that. However, you do need to make sure that you make the initial call on voice, regardless of whether you are using CPDLC or not. Now, CPDLC, although it's a great tool, it's not a replacement to VHF radio. And with CPDLC, VHF remains the primary method of communication, and you must always be able to respond to calls on frequency if a controller wishes to speak to you. En route altitude changes, sometimes it happens, and in Europe, North America, or pretty much anywhere, altitude changes do require ATC clearance, even if they are in your flight plan. So if your SMS says to step climb, you want to change your optimal flight level, your cleared level in the oceanic clearance is different to your current level if you hit the top of descent, or even something as daft as you can't jumping on the keyboard and changing the altitude selector. It all needs to be done through ATC just to make sure ATC know what you're doing. So if you want to change altitude, call up, always ask for it. And just don't expect to get it over the ocean because it's going to be very congested. So that's the Europe portion done. I'm now going to hand over to Alex, one of my oceanic colleagues, who's going to talk a little bit more about operations while you're flying actually across the pond. Hi. Hey, this is Alex here. Um, as uh, Evan mentioned, uh, I do oceanic control and also manage the oceanic airspace for the New York ARTCC here on VATSIM. So uh, in this section, we'll cover you know, where the oceanic facilities are, the differences between the domestic and the oceanic region, um, how you get your clearance, and that's through the NATTRAC program, um, the procedure for actually getting into oceanic airspace and what you do when you're flying there, and then finally, uh, position reports may or may not be required. Um, one thing I will mention as we move through here, a lot of this information is primarily uh, applicable to the North Atlantic region. So that's the region covering Iceland, Reykjavik, Shan uh, Shanwick, Gander, Santa Maria, New York. Um, we do actually have flights going through the South Atlantic this year, which is very exciting. Um, so if you're departing out of Africa, flying through to uh, South America, some of these things apply primarily the cell call procedures and communications procedures, but a lot of the other things like NATTRAC getting your clearances um, are a little bit different down there. And here's where I'll plug again, make sure you read the briefings you get from the, the bookings you get when the emails come out. That will have all the information specific to your flight, whereas the information here broadly applies to the North Atlantic region, and there will be a North Atlantic briefing as well, specifically for the oceanic procedures. So first thing that's different, right? Uh, over the ocean, you're going to get lat long waypoints. So instead of named waypoints, you'll you'll get a definition that says you need to cross this point in space. Um, typically, you'll see them listed in this ICAO format, seven characters. Um, the first two digits are your latitude in degrees, a north south indicator. Very important to check whether you're going north or south. If you're in the uh, South Atlantic, this is probably going to be an S instead of an N. And then three digits with a west or east indicator. Almost all of them are going to be, well, actually, no, some of them might be east in the South Atlantic as well. So again, make sure you're using the correct uh, letter here. So this would be read 54 degrees north and 20 degrees west. The next one is 55 degrees north and 30 degrees west and so on. 
Now, you may or may not be able to enter this into your airplane's FMS as is, or you may need to use a different format. For example, this five digit format matches your standard five character fixes. Um, this is what's called airing 424. Your aircraft may or may not be able to support this. Some aircraft um, have to have you enter it in this format. Some of them actually have to have you go to a separate page and enter, you know, essentially degrees, minutes, seconds, degrees, minutes, seconds. So it's really important for you to check how your particular aircraft works and do this before the event itself. Um, note that also the format um, is different in the North Atlantic versus the South Atlantic. The letters that are used, you'll notice here, right? Five, four and two, zero are, are the same here. And then there's an N tacked on, but in different parts of the world, they use a different letter here. So make sure you understand how uh, your aircraft handles these. Um, and again, the the uh, the name of this format is called Airink 424, A R I N C 424. If you type in Airink 424 lat long, you'll pull up a big document that explains how these are decoded. Um, another thing we want to cover here: uh, we're still working on routing all the flights, but um, you you may sometimes see half degree waypoints. This is something relatively new. Um, in the real world, they've been doing this for a few years, but it's new to VATSIM. Um, they may be including your oceanic routing. And now instead of whole degrees, you may see half degrees or 30 minutes in your lat long waypoints. This format appears similar to the full degrees, but with a 30 minutes tacked on. So we saw before this uh, full degree you translate that, it's all degrees. There's no minutes, there's no seconds. Half degree, you add on an extra two digits. Uh, so typically, these are only added on to the latitude, and then you tack on a couple zeros. So instead of 54 degrees north, this one reads 54 degrees and 30 minutes north. 30 minutes is half of 60 minutes. So that translates to 54.5 degrees north instead of 54 degrees north. And the same caveat here goes uh, as the previous slide. Your aircraft. Uh, how you enter these into your aircraft is going to be specific to that aircraft. So some of them may, again, accept airing 424, and now they have a different format where you put the N in the front in the North Atlantic, or sometimes you put an H in the front, or you may have a separate page that lets you enter um, a fully specified lat long uh, position in degrees, minutes, and seconds. So again, test your aircraft. Make sure you understand how your aircraft works before you actually fly the event. Now, another thing that's very useful across the ocean is what we call cell call or selective calling. Um, we do simulate this over the ocean. Um, the HF radios are very noisy typically in the real world. So the radio system detects a tone that ATC sends out and alerts you in your aircraft. Now on VATSIM, this is implemented via the pilot client and, um, tech, and via the text chat. Uh, the pilot client reads the text chat for you and then plays a little tone for you. So that means you do have to remain tuned to the correct frequency. You can't tune your radio to something else. You can't tune it to one, two, three, four, five, and go talk to your friends or anything like that. You do need to remain tuned to the correct frequency. And you can turn down the radio, but you want to make sure your pilot client is not muted because the pilot client is going to be what's playing the tone over your speakers or over your headset that alerts you to the fact that you're getting called. So again, this is not this is something where if you have the opportunity to test it out before uh, the event, or at, at the very least read the documentation on your pilot client, whether it's Vpilot, Xpilot, or Swift, or whatever you're using. Um, typically, you enter the cell call code when you actually log on the same place you put in your call sign um, to log on to Vatsim, and you will be provided with a cell call code in your booking email. Please use that so that you're not uh, using the same cell call code as someone else. And then when someone gets pinged, like five different people get pinged, that's not a very helpful uh, way of actually getting in contact with people. So make sure you use the one you're using. Make sure you put it in the right place when you log on to the network. Now, Oceanic Clearances. This is one part that only applies to the North Atlantic. If you're flying across the South Atlantic, um, you actually uh, should read the documentation and the briefings provided to you, but typically they don't have a separate clearance requirement. So primarily this applies to North Atlantic. So if you're departing out of Europe, you, uh, this part applies to you. Um, you have to get it prior to entering the oceanic airspace, and it is designed to provide separation across the entire oceanic portion of your flight. So if you're flying, for example, through um, 
Ireland and then going into Shanwick and Gander, you get one prior clearance prior to entering Shanwick. And it covers you all the way through Shanwick and Gander until you pop out the other side into Canadian uh, domestic airspace. Um, you will be required to get some information about your flight and about where you are, what time you're going to get there. You submit the request via NATRAC, which is the clearance system, and then you will get back a clearance. Let's take a look at how that looks like. One, you'll need your route. If you're flying with a slot, you will get a NATRAC assigned to you, so you will not use the random routing system. Use the NATRAC. It saves everyone a lot of time. Your ETA for the Oceanic Entry Point. Again, this is a place where you want to understand how your aircraft works. Um, make sure you understand where you can find the ETA for your oceanic entry point. The oceanic entry point is going to be the first fix on the NAT track. Um, your flight level, which uh, will be assigned to you in your booking for the oceanic crossing only. This is not your current flight level, but the one that's assigned to you that you're going to be flying across the ocean. And then the maximum level that you're able to climb to. You know, you're flying long distance, long haul. Typically, some aircraft may not be able to climb all the way up at max gross weight. Make sure you understand what that is, um, because that gives Oceanic a little bit more flexibility when actually allocating slots uh, across, you know, in the airspace to everyone. And finally, the speed. Uh, what speed would you like? You can pick, typically, you know, you can look at your FMS. It may spit out a econ cruise or a, um, a preferred cruise number, or you can select something different than that as well. But you, you may not necessarily get that depending on the traffic around you. <clears throat> so here we have a couple quitters, excuse me, pictures showing, for example, in this particular FMS, it's showing expecting MAL at 1319er, right? But again, understand your aircraft, it may look different on your aircraft. So in previous events, we've had voice clearances. NATRAC replaces the need to actually leave the domestic controller's frequency and uh, get a clearance via voice. You should request clearance 30 to 60 minutes prior to entry so that you actually have a, an accurate time estimate for when you're going to cross into oceanic airspace. Um, this does not apply if you're departing very close to oceanic airspace. So this primarily means if you're flying out of Dublin, make sure you check there pilot briefing, sometimes you need to get clearance even on the ground or immediately after departing. Um, I don't know if this applies to the UK as much, but again, check the briefings. Make sure you understand that for your particular flight when you need to um, get your clearance. If it doesn't specify, typically 30 to 60 minutes prior is good enough. So here we can see what the NAT track interface looks like. There may be slight differences as we keep tweaking the system, but roughly you put in your call sign, where you're going, what your requested flight level is, which again is assigned to you in your booking, the maximum available flight level you can reach, your requested Mach number, you should select a NAT track. Um, very is very unlikely that you'll need to select a random routing, especially if you're flying on a slot. So please select a track. You'll know the entry fix because that's the first uh, fixed in that track and then the estimated time. The current TMI will be, I believe, 092, which is the day of the year um, of the event. And you'll submit, it'll look something like this at the bottom, and you'll get back eventually a clearance sometime later. And you know, it'll tell you you're clear to your destination via your entry fix, the NAT track, and then any, it'll actually list out the track for you again as well. This is a good spot place to double check your work. Make sure what you submitted and what you're expecting is what you get back. Expectation bias uh, means, you know, you sometimes might skip over and just skim it. Make sure you read these very carefully. And here you see yet another lat long format. And here we have, again, latitude and, uh, and then slash longitude in degrees. So this is 53 north, this is 20 west. Make sure this matches up with what you filed, what's in your computer, and what's uh, what your plane is actually going to do. And then you may see, for example, time restrictions. ATC tells you cross Tober not before 1210. So, you know, check your work, make sure your plane is telling you that you're going to meet that restriction. And then there's some reminders saying, hey, your Mach number changed. So, and also your flight level changed. So compare that. And then when you, you need to talk to your domestic controller, uh, typically Shannon or um, someone from Portugal or Scottish control, 
make sure you talk to them. If you need, if you're flying at, for example, flight level three four zero, and you need to get up to three six zero prior to entering the ocean to meet that clearance, make sure you talk to them. Don't just do it because if you start doing that, you might crash into someone else, and we don't really want to avoid that. If you have any issues with NATRAC, you can talk to your domestic controller. There are ways they can coordinate in the background, um, and they can get you sorted out. So what happens when you actually get into the ocean or you're approaching it and the last radar controller hands you off? Well, first thing you need to talk, you need to tell them who they're, you're trying to call, who you are, and then give them some information. It's just like a standard air traffic control call. So Shamrock Radio, Shamrock Radio version 127, Gander next, which is telling them where, roughly where you're going. They can cross check that. Yes, you're the right person. Request cell call check on, and this is the code. You, this is your cell call code that's provided to you and that you have put into your pilot client. They'll respond, uh, stand by for cell call check, and they'll do a little uh, uh, ATC magic. And you should hear a ping from your pilot client. If it works, respond cell call check OK. And then you can turn down the radio volume. But again, remember, make sure your pilot client can still produce noise and can play that tone for you to hear. If you turn down the pilot client, you might not actually get the cell call ping when it actually comes through for real. And of course, remain on that frequency, even if you have the radio volume itself turned down. And then, of course, you repeat this every time you enter a new oceanic uh, region. Sometimes you may hear the words, uh, position reports not required. That means position reports are not required, just like it says. And across the North Atlantic in particular, a lot of the airspace uses ADS-B or ADS-C now. So it's very rare that you'll actually have to do position reports on the radio channel. The cell call check really is here to make sure ADC can reach you when they need to talk to you. And the radio frequency is there for you to request, for example, speed changes. If you want to go faster, if you want to go slower, or you're burning off fuel, you want to climb higher, you can make that request with the controller. And finally, um, after 30 minutes after entering the oceanic airspace, squawk 2000 so that when you uh, hit the radar service on the other side, you're not squawking a code that someone else has already been assigned and you are already on a non-discrete code. Now, conditional frequency changes. This is something that comes up uh, sometimes on VATSIM, although it's not always simulated. Um, you may be told to contact the next controller at a specific point. So Shanwick may call you, for example, 30 minutes before um, uh, you're going to cross the boundary into Gander and tell you, you know, at 30 west, so at 30 degrees west longitude, call Gander radio on 131.57. That authorizes you to change frequencies when you get there, give Gander a call, repeat your cell call check. And finally, a relatively new procedure that we've been implementing in certain places, it's called OAFs, Operations Without an Assigned Fixed Speed. Traditionally, over the ocean, you get a Mach number, you fly that Mach number, you can't change, you can't deviate from it unless you get instructions from ATC. However, um, depending on traffic volume and what's happening around you, you may get a resume normal speed instruction. So you're now free to adjust your Mach number without, tell without getting prior ATC permission. Now, if you do change your Mach number by 0 0.02 or more, you do need to tell ATC so they know what you're doing, but you don't have to ask for prior permission. Um, you can, of course, always get a maintain Mach um, 0 0.80, 0 0.82, whatever instruction later. That's a speed assignment. You have to return to flying that speed again. But until you get that, if you get a resume normal speed, you're allowed to adjust it. You can fly your econ. You can fly manage speed as long as you tell ATC what you're doing if you're moving your speed by a lot. Um, and this is most commonly used in Santa Maria and New York. Um, less likely to get that in Gander and Shanwick just due to traffic volume. And that's all I had. I'll hit kick it over to Rob. All right, very good. And I am going to cover the North American side of the operation, which for the westbound event is obviously the arrival portion. So uh, we are going to first cover the, the preparation for your descent. We'll then talk about the different types of descent instructions that you will get, uh, specifically uh, compare and contrast uh, Canadian uh, format for descent instructions with U.S. Uh, descent instructions. And then we'll talk a little bit about setting up for your approach and your landing. Now, three key takeaways <clears throat> that we want to uh, 
make sure that you remember. We're going to cover a lot of information here on, on, on this uh, portion of the presentation. But if you take nothing else away from the presentation, remember these three things at the very least. Um, number one, do not ever leave your cruise altitude without having been cleared to. And I say that specifically because these Boeing um, style FMCs are, are, are very keen to help you. They want to help. So they're going to tell you, reset MCP altitude in all caps. Well, that's just a reminder. The FMC doesn't know if your path ahead is clear. The controller does. So you do need to make sure you have that clearance from the controller before you turn that, uh, that altitude selector down without being told to. Um, being told to by your FMC doesn't count. You need to be told to by your controller. Secondly, number two here, what you do between the end of the star and the beginning of the approach procedure, you need to know the answer to that. Don't assume you know. You actually need to look at the chart for the star for the arrival procedure and know what it says to do at the end before you start the approach. Um, we're going to talk a little later in more detail about that, but if you see a discontinuity in your FMC between the end of the star and the beginning of the approach, don't automatically clear that discontinuity. We'll, we'll cover that in more detail in a bit, but um, what a lot of pilots do is they're just trained because they're used to flying in a solo environment without, you know, without being in a multiplayer environment, without other traffic, without human ATC to just delete all those discontinuities and a multiplayer setup like that's in with other traffic and air traffic control. That's not always the right thing to do. Very rarely it is, but, but most often it's not. Uh, what happens is you connect that last point on your star with the, the first point on your approach. Your plane gets to that point and it automatically turns on to the approach. And then the controller's like, what are you doing? Why are you turning without clearance? And what the controllers often hear is <clears throat> the perennial, hold on one second. Guys. What they often hear is the, the pilot says the perennial phrase, my FMC is messing up. Your FMC is not messing up. Your FMC is doing exactly what you told it to do when you connected that point from the star to the point on the approach. So don't tell it to do that and it won't mess up. Finally, number three, um, in the US and Canada, you do not need to report, I'm established on the localizer. That is something that is uh, more of a European or an ICAO um, uh, convention, but in the North America, you don't need to do that. Your approach controller can see that you're established by the fact that you're now tracing that localizer line on their scope. So uh, it ends up being just an unnecessary extra transmission uh, that that in a lot of times the ATC doesn't have time to hear. So once you're cleared for the approach, just join that approach like you've been instructed to. You don't need to report it. The very next thing that will happen is that they will see that you've joined that final approach course and they'll hand you over to the tower controller for your landing clearance. All right, next. We always say a good landing starts with a good approach. Well, a good approach starts with a good briefing. What is a briefing? What do we mean by that? We mean planning out what you're going to do before you do it. Make the plan, then execute that plan. So first and foremost, check the ATIS. You don't need to wait until you're in range in your pilot client. You can actually cheat. You can do dot ATIS, and then you can type in the name of the station. And that's usually the ICAO of the airport with an underscore and then ATIS. And that will bring it up on text in your pilot client. So you can kind of get ahead of the game and, and check it then. At the very latest, though, you want to check it before you reach your top of descent. Now, that ATIS information is going to tell you which approach and landing runway to expect. Um, but a lot of times you're going to be landing at an airport where there might be more than one arrival air, uh, runway in use. And the key thing to keep in mind here is... Um, the center controller generally does not know which approach and runway you're going to get in that situation. Um, it's a that simism, I think, that center controls everything all the way down to the ground. So when you're 500 miles from your destination, you say, hey, Boston Center, what uh, runway can we expect at, uh, at Boston today? If they're going to know because they're also handling Boston approach and, and Boston Tower. But in, you know, in the real world or in a, in a situation where these controllers are, are staffed separately on that sim, Boston Center has no idea what runway you're getting at Boston um, if, they're, if they're arriving on more than one. So uh, what you want to do to stay ahead of the game is pick the one that you think is the most likely. Go through that approach briefing on your own. Then if you happen to get that one, great, you're ahead of the game. If not, then at least the only thing you have to do is rebrief just that approach portion. Everything else you'll have already kind of covered. Um, your star is going to have some different transitions sometimes, depending on which runway or landing that direction they're using. Um, so like in the example that I gave, um, 
you know, Boston might have to tell you, you know, descends via the blank, blank arrival runway, blank transition, like uh, we'll, we'll cover cover in more detail later. Uh, or in, in the case of like Dulles International Airport, uh, the descend via the Hyper 6 or Hyper 7, whatever we're on now, Dulles Landing North or Dulles Landing South. So that at least tells you which fork of the transition you need to take, even though your specific uh, arrival runway hasn't been assigned yet. But what you want to do is you want to compare and make sure that the correct set of points for the fork that you're taking for the transition that you're taking has indeed imported. So you want to check the altitude and speed restrictions along the way as well. So in this case, you know, you want to see that you got Cleb there at 8,000 feet and 250 knots. And then further up the line, you got Hakdu at 5,000 feet and 210 knots. And you want to make sure that those are the correct points for the runway transition that you've been assigned. For the approach, key figures keep in mind are the nav radio frequencies and courses. In some planes, you do have to set those manually. Some planes, you don't. If you need to set those manually, make sure that you do that. But those are the key numbers to know. And then the minimum three-year approach uh, need to be set and well, as well. And you need to be prepared for the decision that you need to make once you get there. And then for the landing, uh, you'd want to know which way you're vacating. So is the terminal on the right if I'm landing on runway 22 or is the terminal on the left? And then uh, you should kind of have a sense of where you're going. Um, in the U.S., we generally don't assign your arrival stand. The controller will ask you, where are you parking today? Um, so it's good to have an answer prepared for that. It doesn't have to be a specific gate number. You might just say anywhere in Terminal 4 is fine. Or you might even say, uh, I'm, I'm done. Just any clo closest gate's fine. But just have an answer prepared, whatever that answer might be. Um, and then when you when you know where you're going, look over those taxi routes. Be familiar with the taxiways that are in that vicinity. You might get a slight variation of what you've briefed, but at least the taxiways in that area will be vaguely familiar to you. So you'll kind of have a sense of what direction they want you to go once you get down. All right, let's talk about your descent instructions. In the U.S. and Canada, we have slightly differing philosophies with how those descent instructions work. In uh, Canada, the chartered restrictions generally apply unless you've specifically been told that they don't apply. And we'll, we'll talk about how that differs from the U.S. in a moment. But in first uh, case here, we'll talk about Canada. So in this example, the instruction is descend 1 1,000. So uh, for first starters, that means to start descending now. That doesn't mean wait until your top of descent. So descend 1 1,000. Descend now. Uh, start that descent. If nothing else, just to start a 1,000 foot per minute descent, and then your vertical path will, will catch up with you. Um, whoop, back up. Second, uh, it means that the crossing altitudes at Lirat here still apply, okay? Because you have been told to disregard them, they still apply. You definitely still need to cross uh, Lirat between 17,000 and 15,000. Um, and that speed restriction to 250 knots there also applies. And then third, you do need to reach that 11,000, even though the descent instruction just said to send one 1,000, because you're following the star, you do need to make that 11,000 by the point called done up. In the next example, they say, when ready, descend one 1,000. Well, this is a little easier because you don't have to start to descend right now. You can probably leave the plane in a vertical uh, descent mode, but, um, Basically, when ready means you can start your descent once you reach your top of descent that your FMC has calculated, or if you're in something really old, something that you yourself have calculated. But similarly, like in the last slide, you do need to um, make that crossing restriction at Lirat between 15 and 17. You do, do need to slow to 250 knots there, and you do need to be at 11,000 uh, by the time you reach Dunup. Uh, example number three, you'll get, you'll simply get this crossing restriction uh, that just says cross done up at one zero thousand. And notice that's a different altitude than what's on the chart. But in this case, the controller needs you a thousand feet lower than the usual way they handle that arrival for whatever reason. That's that reason is on them. They've got an aircraft crossing that at eleven thousand coming from another direction, maybe. So cross done up at one zero thousand. This is a little bit trickier. You do need to meet the altitude restrictions at Lirap, um, you know, 15 to 17 and 250 knots. Um, but then you need to reach 10,000, not 11, by the time you get to Dunop. So the controller's overriding that altitude restriction at Dunop, but the restrictions at Lirap did still apply. So just be very careful about that. Finally, here's how it will sound if a Canadian controller does not need you to keep to the restrictions. They're, they will specifically say, descend unrestricted 8,000. 
So this is, they don't want you mucking about with be at this altitude here, be at this altitude there, proceed directly to 8,000, do not pass go, do not collect $200. This is probably in a mode like flight level change or something like that. But it's basically, you're taking your previously calculated vertical path and you chuck it out the window. And then while it's falling, you race it down to 8,000 feet. Now, by comparison, in the US, if they want you to follow the series of constraints on the star, they're going to specifically say, descend via the blank, blank arrival. Before this happens, you'll want to have gone through the FMC, like we said, and verified that all the correct points with all the correct restrictions are present. But it basically means you start down at your calculated TOD, and you know, same thing as pilot's discretion or when ready, um, make sure you hit all the constraints along the way. Um, you do want to monitor that, making sure that you're adding drag as necessary or whatever you need to do to make sure that the airplane is indeed hitting these restrictions as you go. Um, usually it's, uh, um, it's very easy. You keep the plane in a, in a vertical navigation mode or the equivalent. You lower the uh, mode control panel to the lowest published constraint on that arrival. So you do need to know what's the lowest altitude on this star. Uh, don't lower your MCP any lower than that. So in this case, 6,000 at, uh, at 80. Um, or AB rather. Um, and then they do tell you sometimes landing east, landing north, or whatever, so you know which transition um, that you will need to take. But again, center does not know which specific runway you're arriving at. You won't get that until you get handed over to approach. Um, one weird thing in the US is that modifying your altitude clearance is completely separate from modifying your speed clearance. So when they say descend and maintain, uh, one 1,000, this is essentially going to override all the other altitude restrictions, and you're going to ignore the altitude restrictions at Euro, at an Ocean, and at AB. Um, however, curiously, the um, 250 knot speed restriction at and after Ocean would still apply here. So the override of the altitude does not affect the speed. Kind of a strange thing you need to keep in mind. And likewise, when they say descend at pilot's discretion, maintain one 1,000, that does cancel all the altitude restrictions. It, it just means that you can wait until the, the top of the scent if you choose. But again, that 250 knot restriction starting at ocean is still applicable. Now, side note, once you get down below 10, you're going to be below 250 knots anyway. But notice that the bars at ocean are above and below. So that means you have to be at exactly and maintain 250 knots. Um, so it's not 250 or below because of this restriction. The way it's written, it's 250 period. All right. Now, here's an interesting one that you hear sometimes in the U.S. They say cross blank at and maintain blank. It's kind of equivalent to descend pilot's discretion, except that you do have to make it to that altitude by the time you reach that point. So descend uh, cross ocean at and maintain 8,000. Uh, you can cancel all the other altitudes on this chart, but yet once again, 250 knots still applies. All right, we're going to show you three different examples here of altitude restrictions on the uh, North American chart. So this is a star into Toronto. This is the ragged star. You can see here at Kevno, you need to be at exactly at 8,000 feet and 210 knots. Uh, this is the ocean arrival into Boston. You can see that on these FAA charts over here, uh, you got two different forms of altitude information. So we're going to kind of go over this real quick. The restrictions by each point are listed by the name. Now, the green box isn't actually on the chart, this is added for the graphics uh, uh, for illustration purposes, the green box won't be there, but the altitude listed right by the name of the waypoint is the one that you wanna look at. These altitudes, they're, I'm gonna not say that they're unimportant, but for purposes of this discussion, ignore them. Um, you know, go by the altitude listed at uh, each point here, so by at or above 15,000. Now, finally, is the Parch arrival into Kennedy. This is a kind of a completely different philosophy here. It says to expect 12,250 knots. I do think you should enter that into your FMC because that is going to influence where your top of descent is calculated. If you don't enter that, your plane might start descending late and you will be too high or too low at this altitude because it's using some other generic calculation. So it's good to put that into the FMC anyway, but just keep in mind, you haven't been specifically told that that's your crossing restriction until the controller issues it, and you shouldn't start down toward it until the controller tells you to. We did touch on this earlier, but I'm going to say it again. Know what you need to do at the end of the star, because except in very rare cases, it is not going to be just join the approach without being told to. In this example, you say 
Uh, it says expect radar vectors to final approach course after LaGuardia VOR. Sometimes you get the uh, in instruction before you get there anyway. Like in this case, it says fly heading 170 vectors to final. That does mean go ahead and do that now. Don't wait until after uh, LaGuardia. If they want you to turn after LaGuardia, they will actually say depart LaGuardia heading 170 vectors for the approach. But that's not what's shown here. So when you get that fly heading, that's basically they're breaking you off of the rest of the star. Um, and you're starting to work you over toward your approach. Uh, one prime example of what we mentioned a couple times now, the last instruction here is uh, Joe B at 6,210 knots and then on track 213, expect radar vectors. It does not mean you can connect Joe B with the first point on your approach. The dotted green line here, pass Joe B straight on till morning, Peter Pan. Um, so depending on the plane, you might have to switch out of VNAV mode and into a heading mode, but the point is you do whatever it takes to avoid turning without being told to turn. This is an example of this exact situation. This is the Banker 2 arrival into Charlotte. And notice when you're landing on the 18s after Jordan, you're supposed to stay on a course of 003. The key phrase here, expect radar vectors. The FMC, it's a little hard to read, it's a little blurred there, but it's showing you about a route discontinuity. And there's a tendency for um, uh, inexperienced sim pilots to erase the discontinuities. It's not like a master caution. It's not telling you something is wrong. It's just letting you know that that route doesn't connect. But uh, failing to connect those routes might be the appropriate thing to do in this case. Otherwise, you're going to accidentally turn toward Cavi after you pass Jordan instead of staying on that 003 track. And you're going to be cutting on in front of the path of another plane that was already coming down the pike there toward Cavi. So... Don't say my FMC is messing up. Just don't erase that discontinuity and you'll be fine. <laughs> All right, real quick, I've got a couple minutes, uh, but we're going to run through a quick checklist for flying across the pond. Number one, they mentioned it before, read the pilot briefings for the origin and destination airport and your oceanic crossing. Those are going to be on ctp.vatsin.net. Definitely check those out because they're going to have a lot of very specific information about your, your specific origin and destination, plus the oceanic crossing. You definitely want to get updated scenery for your origin and destination. Recommendations for that are probably going to be in those pilot briefing documents that we just mentioned. Uh, the route should be emailed to you the night before, or if it's not emailed, it'll be on your booking. So you go back to ctp.vatsin.net, and, uh, and that route that they want you to fly will be right there. Just use that. Um, get the charts that you need. Um, in the in the U.S., they're all freely available through Sky Vector, but uh, outside of the U.S., ChartFox, or if you have a Navigraph subscription, that's a great resource. Uh, consider a, a subscription. It's it's not mandatory that you have one to fly on that's in, but it's a great resource, especially for this event. Pack extra fuel. You're going to get delayed on the ground. You're going to get held in the air. You're going to get delayed on the arrival. If you don't, hey, you lucked out this year, but generally you want to bring extra fuel. Uh, you want to connect about 45 minutes before your calculated slot time and push about 20 minutes before your slot time. However, that instruction might be overridden by recommendations that you read in the pilot briefing for your origin airport. So these are general guidelines. The pilot briefing for your origin might have more specific guidelines. Go with what's in that document. If not, this gives you at least an idea what time you need to commit to uh, get ready for the event. Uh, limit the use of text. Um, if you are generally on voice, stay on voice. Don't try to, if the controller is very busy, don't try to use text to get a message to them. Uh, like it's basically like jumping the queue. Um, everyone's trying to reach the controller. Everyone's in the same boat. Just stay on voice. Uh, unless you're a person who uses text because you need to use text. Um, and then pay attention, keep track, uh, distractions to a minimum. Look guys, I know there's a ton of great live streamers going to be streaming that day. I might even know a few. Um, but just keep distractions to a minimum, especially during those critical times when you're in the terminal environment. Um, don't, uh, you know, don't be paying attention to my live stream and not be paying attention to your controller who's now trying to call you for the third time. Um, don't try to do something special, guys. Look, I know that I'm I'm sp I'm I'm known for trying to fly non RNAV events. I'm known for 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 trying to fly uh, vintage aircraft into Friday night ops events. Uh, I like to feel like I can read the room, and if it's too busy, I know that I can go somewhere else. On cross the pond day, just assume they're going to be too busy to handle that kind of stuff. Don't uh, don't be trying to do something special. Don't be trying to fly something from the 1970s. Um, do what everyone else is doing, and uh, do it as well as everyone else is doing it. Um, cross the pond day is not uh, not I'm going to be cooler than everybody else day. It's 
do whatever you can to make the co controller's job as easy and as copy and paste as possible. If, however, you're given an instruction that you don't understand, do be that guy. Do be the guy who asks for a repeat because the amount of time it takes them to repeat is less than the amount of time it takes them to clean up the mess if you've then cut somebody off and they've got to resequence the entire line. So definitely ask for clarification if you need to. I'm going to leave you on a page of additional resources. A lot of these are great stuff that um, helped me get ready for my first cross the pond six years ago. Um, but at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Evan. Oh, Rob, thank you very much. And of course, uh, yourself, Alex and Joshua for an excellent presentation, really covering, as we said, everything that we uh, or pilots need to know for participating in the event this year. So now is the time to start sending in your questions and we'll be here to answer questions for as long as we need to. I've got a number of questions sent in via the FSA chat over in the Vatsim Cross the Pond Discord on the Vatsim Twitch channel, Vatsim YouTube channel. That's where I'm looking for questions. I know Rob's keeping an eye on his Twitch channel. I think Joshua is keeping an eye on TFDI design. So please, if you have questions, fire those into the chat wherever you're watching. And I'm going to start asking questions now, but as they keep going in, I'll keep an eye out and continue to make sure I pick up all of those questions. So let me get started. I'll talk first about sort of flight planning, filing your flight plan, and then we'll talk about questions in Europe and go from there. So flight planning question to start with, anyone of you guys can answer this. When booking the slot, or I guess when filing my flight plan, what maximum flight plan or what really what flight plan altitude should I be entering? Rob, do you want to take that one? Um, okay, yeah. So the the flight plan that you put into that booking slot would uh, the flight plan altitude that you put in that booking slot would be the initial altitude that you want to be cleared to. So a lot of times when you're planning, if you're looking at something like Sim Brief and it's giving you some kind of step climb recommendation, um, particularly because, like you mentioned earlier, uh, or one of us mentioned earlier, I don't remember who it was, that the plane's going to be pr pretty heavy and it's not going to be able to make necessarily make it up to that final altitude. Um, on the initial climb. So you're probably going to want to level off at say, for example, flight level 340 with the intent to fly to climb to 380 further along, or maybe um, as you get closer to that oceanic track. So 340 would be the appropriate thing to put in your booking because that's the first thing that they're going to clear you to as your initial cruise. Right. So the first westbound altitude that your airplane yeah, can get exactly. to would basically be the answer. Right. Yeah. And yeah, you will and, be and, given... And, and, uh, Oh, go ahead, Rob. I was just going to say a good point is that because it is a westbound domestic altitude, it will normally conform to, with a few exceptions, normally conform to that um, uh, that even numbered thousand flight level. So, you know, 320, 340, 360 and so forth. Yeah. And then, of course, you will if when you have a route and you have your booking, you'll be given an altitude. But remember, that altitude is for the oceanic portion of your flight. So it's not the altitude that you need to file initially. It will probably or potentially anyway be a wrong way eastbound altitude because we use every altitude over the ocean that we can to try and stack all the airplanes in there. Again, you want to follow the altitude that's correct for your direction of flight. So probably a westbound altitude and pick whatever you think you can get to initially in your airplane. If you plan a step climb later, or if you have a different altitude over the ocean that gets addressed later on. And as always, no altitude changes unless you have a clearance. So do not change altitudes, even if your FMS tells you to, till you get to that point. A uh, few people asked about when, or sorry, Robbie, when I follow up on that? I was just going to say, the other thing to keep in mind is you may not, because of the volume of traffic, you may not be able to get the plane to the optimal cruise level for your maximum fuel right. efficiency. This is just going to be a day where you burn some extra fuel, man. That's just yeah. <laughs> plan for it. Absolutely. Rob, do you want to talk, since we were talking before, about uh, routes, pilot briefs, for people who have slots, when can they expect to be given all that information? Okay. Um, well, right now, so the, uh, the the people that have a booking appointments are booking through um, twenty one hundred Zulu tonight. So, um, so people that were in that slot lottery, the express the interest um, before March fifteenth, they got booking appointments. Those booking appointments end um, this evening at twenty one hundred Zulu. Um, the rest of the slots get released on the twenty seventh. Uh, 20 Zulu on the 27th, so two days from now. And then uh, you have to reconfirm if you have a, a booked slot, you need to get on, back on the CTP website, reconfirm that slot between the 27th and the 30th. And then at the 30th is, I think, the point where, or yeah, yeah, those uh, unconfirmed are going to be re-released back into the pool and you might be able to grab up one at the last minute. 
Is that yeah. what you were asking? I, I, yeah, I think that, that pretty much covers it. So okay. if you if you were given an initial slot in the lottery, you're basically confirming it now. People have asked, you know, I didn't get a slot. What do I do? So Rob, just remind people that those slots will become available if there's anything left. Like if you haven't gotten a slot yet, there's still a chance, right? Yeah, right. So the, the ones that were not booked uh, in the appointment booking process, they get released to the public on the 27th at 2000. So that'd be a good time to mark on your calendar, snap up any of the uh, remaining slots, which there may not be too many of them. Um, but then sometime on the 30th, and they haven't nailed down a specific time yet, but sometime on the 30th, um, they will release anything that has not been reconfirmed by everyone who has uh, booked a slot. So when you book a slot, you got to reconfirm it between the 27th and the 30th. If you don't, be ready to snap up those unconfirmed slots on uh, on the 30th. And then and Alex the maybe first, they all lock, and then by that point, bookings are closed. You either have a slot or you don't. Perfect. And then Alex, since you're the one who's doing a lot of these routes, if you could maybe speak to when will pilots be given their specific route and their pilot briefing documents if they have a booked slot and they've confirmed it. Yeah, so um, we're, we're still working on route planning, um, and that typically runs through next week. But uh, you will, uh, if you're flying and you have a slot, you will get your information no later than uh, late on the 31st. So you should have at least 12 hours um, to look at all of your information. And we'll start actually posting the pilot briefings uh, onto the CTP website, ctp.vatson.net. Um, in the coming days, so you can start, you can get a head start on that, and then you won't get your final route until probably the night before, but you will have some time uh, the night before to, uh, and the morning of to look at your route, plan it out, um, and give yourself a little time to do that before you actually log on. Question for uh, maybe Josh, you want to take this one? A question from the Vatsim Twitch, number 321 Tango Foxtrot asks, Do we have to fly on a current ARAG? Uh, so I, I guess the real answer is no, you, you're not required to. However, I would, I would strongly recommend it for cross the pond. Um, if you take like the UK, for example, Manchester, I'm quite familiar with it. We've changed the arrival routings in the SIDs get changed. Uh, so to make sure that you're on the same par with everybody else and the vast majority of people use the updated air rack, I would recommend it, but it's, you, you're under no obligation to with that to use an updated air rack, but if you can, then obviously I'm going to recommend that massively. From the Cross the Pond Q&A chat, uh, Rasmus asks, is there an earliest time before departure that you can connect up? Could you connect two hours in advance? What's the recommendation for when you actually get started? Josh, if you want to take that right. one from a Europe perspective. Yeah, right on. Um, I guess the, the real answer to that one is you've got to be mindful of the other people that are also there. And if you're you know, connecting to Vatsim really early, there's going to be less space available for people that maybe are connecting after you so i would say to allow time for clearances about well you're going to have your departure time your, your calculated takeoff time anyway so i would probably go somewhere in the region of 45 minutes to an hour before then just to give yourself time to request your clearance and get pushed back and taxi up because you could be waiting a long time to taxi um so about an hour before would probably be a good happy number and again uh, some I mean, places uh, go ahead alex i know i finished this topic uh, i have one thing about the air Act thing Sure. Yeah. I was just going to point out that, you know, a couple places facilities might actually specify in the pilot brief, here's the time to connect, or here's how early we recommend connecting. So some places will include that. Definitely something to have a quick look at. Uh, just before we move on to that question or that topic, uh, Alex, just one more that's directly related to this, which was, okay, you're connected. How early before departure should I be calling for uh, an IFR clearance or requesting it through a DLC tool? So Josh, I think probably the same answer there, right? It's just look at the pilot briefing. If there's nothing in the pilot briefing, you know, I would say probably a a half hour, 45 minutes before is probably a reasonable guesstimate, but I'm betting that most pilot briefings will explain a specific time. And a lot of facilities in, in North America will just send you your clearance as soon as we see you online. I think Europe is a little different because we're often using DLC. If you want to talk at all more to that, Joshua. Yeah, I, I guess it, it, it all varies. I would follow the pilot briefing as much as possible. Or if, if not, if you're just not sure, just have a best guess. Just bear in mind, there's going to be a lot of traffic, a lot of delays. So just give yourself time. Yeah, there you go, Ray. And Alex, you want to talk to Eric? Yeah, so actually there is one, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's one thing we've been working with on the planning team is that London uh, West is reconfiguring their airspace about a week before the event. Actually, like today, I guess. The Eric <laughs> drops today or in the yeah. next day or two. So there may be 
fixes or airways that are not currently in uh, the air rack from last month that are in the air rack that drops in the next couple of days. Make sure if you're flying through London, if you're flying through the UK, um, which again, you don't, we won't know yet, but um, I would say just update your air rack. It'll make everyone's lives easier. Um, you know, one of the weird things that the FAA does right is that they push out the fixes like months in advance and they're just no tan. But uh, unfortunately, the UK is just doing a hard sh changeover. All the new fixes appear um, in the new air racks, so they are not in any of the older racks. So make sure if you're flying through Western Europe, particularly if you're departing, say, like Amsterdam or Paris or something, you're going to be going through the UK. Make sure you update your air racks. Do they have no sensitivity to the fact that we have a major event going on next week? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Just rude. I uh, want to ask a couple questions about DLC or getting an IFR clearance through non-voice means. A question from Surgeon asked about uh, DLC, specifically Istanbul on their website, basically says that clearance delivery is mandatory through DLC. Now, remember, that's just what their website says for every other day. Cross the pond could be different. So, of course, look at the pilot brief would be the first answer. But I did reach out to the event and PR director at Turkey just to make sure. And the answer there is just specifically for Istanbul, but probably relevant for most airports on the eastern side of the ocean you can request your clearance through a software like easy cpl dlc or if your airplane is integrated with that which some are you can use the dlc tool but as with probably any airport i'm sure if you don't have the ability to do that or if there's a problem getting your clearance through text you can always ask via voice and that was just recently confirmed by the event director so i just wanted to pass that on for the person who'd asked that question uh, joshua another question relating to cpdlc do you need to tell ATC on initial contact that you're CPDLC equipped or is the default assumption that you are? So I'm not an area controller, um, so I'm not 100% sure of the answer. Um, but typically you can always call up, you need to call them to let, you know, let them know you're on their frequency and then you could always just pop a little message like the notify message through the, the CPDLC client that you're using and then they can either accept it or deny it and know at that point you're using data link to communicate with them. And Rob, since this often comes up in North America, what do we do about CPDLC? Nothing. <laughs> so we don't use it. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So if you're wondering, you know, this is mostly a Europe thing. I don't think uh, anything in that can and nothing in that USA right now is using CPDLC at all. So unfortunately for everyone from Europe who's used to flying there and just doing all the textual stuff, you're going to have to talk here in North America. Uh, Alex, an uh, oceanic, although I guess it probably applies anywhere during the flight, but a question from Justin. If you are disconnected at some point mid-flight, you're starting from an autosave, you need to reconnect, what's the best procedure to kind of inform controllers and get back online? Yeah, and this is always a tough one. Um, if, if it's just a straight disconnect and your sim is still running, your plane is still moving, and basically you haven't paused or sped up, or basically you're where we expect you to be, I would say just reconnect, let the controller know. Um, honestly, if you disconnect and pop up exactly where you're supposed to be, you may not even need to net let the controller know because you know things like that happen all the time. We're used to it. If your sim actually crashes or freezes, and for example, you're not moving for a minute or two minutes, you know, over the ocean, you're probably going seven, eight, nine miles a minute, right? So you will end up in a different place. Um, in that case, um, uh, there are actually uh, some sometimes you can use loss comp procedures or deviation procedures. You pull yourself off the route. But I think the easiest situation in this case may be to reconnect as an observer. Just message the uh, controller. Let them know r roughly where you are, um, and they can work out a place for you to reconnect to. Um, but I would at the very least get your sim back up and running, get the plane moving again so that you're not you don't end up too far from where we expected you to be. Yeah, and I mean, there's no, like you said, Alex, there's really no perfect solution to this because the controllers may be really busy. And like, if you honestly, if you send me a DM and I'm busy, I'm probably not going to answer it anyway. And I'm like, right. where are you? I don't know where you are. Just reconnect. We'll figure it out, right? So there's no perfect yep. answer if your SIM crashes. But I agree that the best thing you can do is if you can keep moving and just reconnect exactly where you should be, that's the best situation. If right. not, you know, it is what it is. Obviously, we want you to have a good experience. So come back on the network. We'll figure it out with you. You know, you might have to get a couple vectors or a spin just to get you back in the sequence. But yep. we'll work our, we'll work it out and make sure you get yeah, back and, on. And th this is, I would say, actually, it's easier. It's less of a problem over the ocean than if you're in the terminal right. environment. If you're in the terminal environment, yeah, I would say just reconnect. They'll figure it out. And th they'll see you disconnect because you're your track will coast 
Um, but yeah, it, especially if you're over the ocean, I would say just reconnect. If you if your sim crashed and you end up somewhere other than where you were supposed to be, and just let the controller know if they're not too busy. Yeah. Uh, Josh, I'll ask you this question, being that you're TFDI design, I'm sure you could speak to airplanes pretty well. Is there a minimum uh, system or set of systems that an airplane needs to fly in the event? Just reading that off of uh, Twitch. I don't know if I can quite pronounce the names. So I'm not going to try. But is there, you know, what do you recommend? Tim kind of hit on this at the beginning of the presentation. But what do you recommend for the right kind of aircraft to participate in this event? So it's quite obvious. It's probably going to have something that has an autopilot. Um, you you're going to struggle about you know hand flying an aircraft all the way across. Uh, I would definitely say something that's probably got jet engines as well, um, just to make sure that you're not going super duper slow. Um, and at a bare minimum, some form of navigation, whether it's you know it's a GPS or an FMC, just some form of navigation so that you're not relying on you know the navigraph charts to kind of pinpoint where you're going. Uh, it's just just something that's above the basic. Doesn't necessarily need to be the most fancy aircraft like the A380 with all, and all that. So it doesn't need to be anything like that. Um, but just the bog standard stuff that you'd expect in an IFR aircraft in in this age. Is that can it can the seven seventeen make it across the ocean? Uh oh, I'd, I think with the extra fuel tanks, it probably could. Will the MD eleven be released in time? No, <laughs> <laughs> let's judge that one. Definitely not. Uh, ah, I was going to say, it, 717 can playing. make it across the ocean if it's in the um, storage area of an A380. <laughs> 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 write that one um, down, I don't remember that. Francesco was asking if there's a good document or a website to see the differences between Europe and US Canada procedures. I mean, that's really what this presentation is supposed to be, if I'm honest. I think this is probably the place that I would recommend if you watch this presentation back if you need to. We've got all the slides available on our website as well. Link is on the screen. Rob, have you got any thoughts for people who are looking at kind of a comparison between the two sides of the ocean, where else folks could go? Um, there are, I mean, so there's a handful. I think Aviation Pro, and the tutorials are a couple of years old at this point, but I think he's got a very good... Uh, comparison of European flying versus US flying, that's not too bad. So that's that's another one you can go. I mean, there's really a lot of good, if you type in, and I would stick I would stick with, you know, if you're going to Google, you know, that sim blanks, just so you're not bogging yourself down with a whole bunch of stuff that might be pertinent to other networks or might be pertinent to real world that might be over and above what you need to know for us. But there's some good that sim tutorials, individual streamers, individual content creators that have some US versus um, Europe, Oceanic, uh, um, or I'm sorry, yeah, US versus versus Europe procedure and terminology differences that you can find by uh, by a, a relatively uh, modest YouTube search or Google search. Yeah, and I think we've, we've said it a few times, but it's always worth just mentioning again. We as controllers understand that if you're from the eastern side of the ocean and it's your first time flying on the western side of the ocean, things are going to be a little bit different for you. This may be the first time and maybe the last time that you're going to fly, say, in the United States for the year. So we do understand that. Try your best to listen and follow along with the procedures. But whenever you hear something that you don't understand or you're wondering about it, you know, just clarify it. I mean, sometimes it's busy, but if you're not sure, we'd much rather you ask the question and we are on the same page versus you make an assumption that's different than the assumption that I've made as a controller, and now you're going to a different place than I wanted you to be. So if you're ever unsure, especially if you're from a different part of the world and you haven't heard a term before, just ask and we'll do our best to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Rob yeah. and Joshua, I know you guys are looking at streams as well. Any questions, comments that you wanted to bring out from your chats here before we wrap up? If Yeah, if you don't mind, I want to yeah. jump in because we were talking about what you what you should or shouldn't fly across the ocean. And I had a question yeah. from my chat uh, over on the Slant Alpha Adventures Twitch stream from a user named Bad Turbulence. He says, is there a list somewhere of uh, planes which accept uh, lat long in different formats uh, so that he knows kind of which ones he should be looking at and which ones might be too much of a pain to worry about. I I, I said most of them do accept that five character Airing 424 format at this point. Uh, certainly, most of your 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 Boeing's and Airbuses I think accept that Airing 424. But if anyone knows of specific ones that do or don't, we'll welcome any thoughts. Yeah, and and I'll add one thing also. This is Alex again here. Um, an, a good check is sometimes they'll list the lat long on uh, with the fix or 
check that your leg lengths make sense. So from one fix to the next fix, typically it should not be more than 600 miles. So if you see like a 1200 mile leg somewhere, you probably <laughs> entered a fix wrong. Um, typically across the ocean, your fixes, your, your waypoints are going to be between 300 and 600 miles apart. So that's a good uh, sanity check as well. Do you, does any of you know specifically um, certain add-ons which don't accept for, uh, points in that Airink 424 format? Uh, I don't actually fly planes very much, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know, but I think most, like most, should, as far as I can tell, uh, because yeah, obviously that was, that's a, that was my thought. Yeah, I think so too. So I would imagine that most should, but I mean, it's, it's easy to find out, right? Just go if you're thinking about flying a particular airplane that you already have. Go load it up in the simulator, try and punch those in. Oftentimes in the manual that might come with the airplane, it will explain how to enter these because they are a little bit different from FMS to FMS system to system. Right. And as Alex says, you know, you can just do a little bit of a sense check. So look at the overall length of your route, compare that to the actual distance. If you were to plot it, say in Sky Vector, make sure that they're kind of around the same distance as a good cross check. Or if you have like a view that allows you to see your route across the actual screen in front of you, you can actually sort of move along or step along the waypoints and make sure that that route looks like it's a single straight line there's no 180 degree curve backs in the middle of it that's a good sense check <laughs> to just make sure that everything's plugged in properly and then obviously as you're actually flying it right you're watching and you're looking in front of you and if all of a sudden you see the airplane's gonna want to make a 90 degree turn chances are the route isn't supposed to do that so maybe something is plugged in wrong those are some good sense checks that you can make just to be sure everything's plugged in correctly um, the only other chat, the question that came up in my chat, um, if and I know it was was covered when we talked about Oceanic, but can we just do a real quick point by point recap? Um, which sectors are indeed using um, net track for position reports, and which are going to be using voice position reports, or have has everything flipped over to net track by this point? Yeah, so actually, so net track is specifically for clearances, um, and so oh, okay. if you're departing out of Europe. Um, you will be using that track to get your oceanic clearance. If you're departing out of Africa, uh, this is a place where I'm going to say it again, check your pilot briefing. Um, the, the, they don't actually specifically require clearances to enter the ocean most places except the North Atlantic, and that's just because the North Atlantic is so congested and so busy all the time. So again, check your pilot briefing, and as for position reports, basically you know, reporting that I'm here at this time doing this altitude and Mach number, that's been eliminated almost everywhere in the North Atlantic. Right. In the South Atlantic, there are a couple mandatory reporting points, but how you report those specifically, again, will be in your uh, pilot briefing. So just make sure you read up on that. Okay, yep. Rob, any other questions or Joshua, anything from your side? Everything else that got asked in my um, tw uh, Twitch chat basically got covered by our presentation like right after it was asked. So. <laughs> <laughs> Love when that happens. I guess people, people were like right in tune with where we were about to go with it. So I think it worked out pretty good. <laughs> Good stuff. Joshua, anything from you or anything, Alex, that you wanted uh, to just add on? Yeah, we had one question of how can you book slots without the lottery? Rob, do you want to hit that one more time? Yep. Yep. I'll come back to that one more time. So the slot, there's there's two opportunities, basically. Um, the appointed slot, the appointments for booking slots are, are going through 2100 today. Um, the date and time which they are being, the, the remaining slots are being released to the public is the 27th, I think at 20 hundred, let me get that in front of me again, because I don't want to want to be wrong about it, but I'm pretty, pretty certain. Uh, yeah, 27th. So uh, two days from now at 20 hundred Zulu time is when all the remaining slots are bookable by anybody. Um, however, there probably won't be too many left. The last opportunity is between the 27th and the 30th, everybody that has a book slot needs to go and reconfirm that book slot, i.e. you need to uh, affirm the fact that, hey, you know, you don't have some significant other that's just like, hey, you want to do what all day on Saturday? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so if you've now cleared it with the boss that you're going to be at the computer all day, you're going to go back onto the website, reconfirm that slot, ctp.vatin.net, reconfirm that, yes, I am going to fly that slot on uh, Saturday the 1st. Um, if you don't do that, then that slot will be re-released on the 30th. So you have between the 30th and the 31st to grab up those unreconfirmed slots, if you want to call them that. So 27th at 20, and then 30th at some unspecified time, there will be two more opportunities to kind of snap up some leftover slots. 
And friendly reminder, of course, if you don't have a slot, do not fly across the ocean during Cross the Pond. Right. You're more than welcome to come on the network. You can fly in Europe. You can fly in North America. You can fly in Africa. You can fly anywhere on the network except anywhere over else. oceanic yes, airspace. Anywhere else. <laughs> and we would love if you know see, if you happen to see a facility that is staffed that isn't one of the you know Cross the Pond facilities, they are probably just bored, dying for some airplanes to come visit them. So that would be a great place to go hang out if you're not flying across the ocean. Alex, you said you had a couple more uh, points you wanted to add to U.S. flight. Yeah, yeah, and Rob did a great job about like procedural things and things you can see on the charts and what to expect. Uh, just a couple more things, um, kind of what as a pilot, what are you going to expect to see from the controls, especially if you don't fly um, in the U.S. a lot? You know, Evan and I are both controllers in the Northeast. We like our speed control a lot. If we assign you a speed, maintain that speed until we tell you otherwise. Um, on a, the one thing that is different in the U.S. as opposed to elsewhere, when you get an approach clearance, that cancels your speed clear um, assignment unless they tell you to do something like maintain 180 knots until Zalpo, for example, if you're flying a Kennedy. Now, you're going to hear these fixed names, so this goes back to having a good briefing, right? When you're looking at your charts, find the final approach fix because typically you're going to get a speed control instruction, especially if it's super busy like this, 180 knots to Zalpo, 170 knots till ebby something like that you're gonna you're gonna hear fixed names but you want to be familiar with them from your briefing of your approach uh plate so that you know that you know you can expect that i know this is where i'm going to slow down this is where i'm going to drop the gear this is where i'm going to put the flaps in and you're prepared for all those things Perfect. Sounds good, Alex. Thank you for that. So just some last uh, takeaways, maybe, Josh, if folks wanted to find you or TFDI Design or Invernix or anything else, Joshua, where can they find you if they have any questions for you or they want to learn any more? If you've got any questions, you want to learn more about what we do, the best place is going to be our website, tfdidesign.com. And on there, we've got all the social media and the Discord servers. You can feel free to come and join us anytime you want to have a chat, especially if you're interested in the MD-11. We're, we're more than happy to talk about that. Perfect. And Rob, I think you run some sort of a Twitch channel, right? Yeah, well, I don't know if I run it. It runs me most of the time, but uh, <laughs> twitch.tv slash slant alpha adventures. Now, those of you who know what slant alpha means know that uh, modern jetliners with FMCs is not kind of the core focus of what I do, but uh, we do occasionally do some airliner stuff. And, uh, and I've been a pilot on VATSIM for coming up on 13 years. And the, the first five of that was pretty much all airliner flying. So, um, so yeah, we I have some some level of knowledge, I guess, or at least like to fake it. Um, but uh, yeah, come on over to the Slant Alpha Adventures Twitch channel. We've also got a Discord uh, where we have a good community over there with uh, questions and answers always welcome. So uh, jump in over there anytime. And Alex, obviously part of the Cross the Pond team, New York ARTCC. If you want to talk to either of those two things here as we wrap up, yeah, uh, all of us at the planning team, the event uh, team are really excited to put this on. Um, we hope you all enjoy. And uh, of course, I'll throw, shout out my own facility, New York ARTCC. Um, we got great controllers. We're online a lot. Some great airspace to fly in. It's very challenging, but it's a lot of fun. So come fly with us. Or if you want to control, come join us as a controller too. Perfect. Well, thank you very much to all three of you once again for being on and taking the time to give this informative webinar. This is something that we try to do before every cross the pond to give pilots a little bit more of an understanding as to how the air traffic control side of this event works. There is a crazy amount of planning. Alex has been involved in it. I've kind of seen the messages going back and forth around routing, around slots, around which airports go into this event. And it's all designed to give you a great experience on Saturday, April 1st. So hopefully you're able to join us flying across the the pond. If you're not able to do that part, come on the network, hang out with us somewhere in North America, somewhere in Europe, somewhere in Africa, somewhere somewhere other than the middle part of the world across the ocean, which of course is reserved for folks with a slot time. Thank you again for watching today's presentation brought to you by Flight Simulation Association. Feel free to join us over at flightsimassociation.com. You can create a free account, you can ask questions in our Discord, and of course you can get all the latest news on Flight Sim Expo. Thanks again to our presenters, to Tim for coming on and introducing today's panel and for all of you for watching. That's it for us, but we'll see you on April 1st for Cross the Pond.